What's up, Tubaniacs? It's great to be back here for week two of the Ugly Duck podcast. Lots to discuss here. Lots going on in the hockey world right now. Coming up, we have a very special guest. He just might be the most prolific producer of all time ever to walk the planet. And now he's entering the world of hockey as a co-owner of the NHL's latest franchise, the Seattle Kraken. That's right, Jerry Bruckheimer will be joining us here on the Ugly Duck podcast right here. So stay right there. Don't go away because we got a great show coming up. Before we get to Jerry Bruckheimer, let's talk some hockey. Mo Darwich, my producer, here to talk some hockey with us today. Mo, what do we got? Oh, man, so much. Yeah, what do. a exciting qualifying <laughs> round leading into now the quarterfinals. Let's jump right into it. I'd say probably... Hold on, Mo. Okay. Hold on. Let me talk to the, the Ugly Duck fans here for a second. Now, I may have made some predictions. We're going to get into it later in the show. Just understand that I didn't have any prior knowledge to how teams were going to play before the playoffs started. That's all I'm going to say. They've been calling you out in the comments. Okay, the that's way. fine. But my predictions moving forward are going to be solid. Let's go. Okay, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. But let's wrap it up, okay? Looking at the, the round robin of it all, looking at the qualifiers of mm -hmm. it all, we had one sweep. We had 6-3-1 series. Only one game five, right? 44 games in nine days. Eight teams have left the bubble, including both host teams, mm -hmm. right? But let's jump right into the round robin of it all. Okay. Both one seeds, Bruins and Blues, go 0-3, and, and we'll drop to the fourth seed in the first round of the playoff here. Golden Knights and Flyers both go 3-0. and What do you think about these teams? Are they going to continue this sort of momentum on each side heading into this elimination round? Am I shocked about the Flyers going 3-0? and No, I'm not, because I feel like they were the only team in the row. Well, one of the only teams that really had something to prove. The other teams had, you know, great, great seasons, but they were kind of expected to have great seasons. I, my opinion, I didn't really like the round robin. You know, I watched all the games. I liked watching the Toronto series. I liked watching Montreal, Pittsburgh. I liked watching that playoff series. I don't, the round robin for me was just like, you know, even when the games were good, you're like, it doesn't really matter. Other than that Colorado St. Louis game that went, went right down to the wire. That was the most exciting round robin game for me to watch. Um, but it's playoff time now. And you talk about it. Both host teams are gone. It's going to get interesting. I'm looking round robin coming out of it. You look at Vegas. I thought Vegas looked good. Yeah. I thought Vegas looked really good. It's going to be exciting. Dude, the series. West is going to be tough, yeah. tough to make picks, but I'm making them today. Let's go. All right. Getting into the qualifiers, obviously Carolina looked great, right? Unbelievable. And I call that, yes. I said that they were going to be tough to beat and I didn't want to put it out there. Cause I'm listen, I'm still playing. I'm also, also not trying to disrespect any teams out there. But I knew that that Carolina team was going to be, listen, they're a problem. Carolina is a problem. I would hate to play Carolina right now. Yeah. They look great. Outscored the Rangers 11 goals to four in the series. Defense played great. Oh, Broly. Nasty. Oh, nasty. 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 Mrazic. Uh, Raymer. They put in Raymer in the third game. He played lights out as well. How, how is it? You have two great goalies as listen. an option. Mrazic, Reimer, two good goalies, but it seems that everybody that steps into the lineup for Carolina looks good. And guess Dougie Hamilton, has he even touched the ice yet? I think he's coming. Their team is a problem, and it's going to be a problem for whoever they play. So anybody picking Carolina to win, I mean, that's a, that's a safe bet. They're a good team. New York Rangers moving forward. Anything to say to their fans? <sighs> well... I only speak to my New Jersey fans. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you heard it there. Uh, number 12, Montreal eliminates Pittsburgh three games to one. You called Why? it. You called it. Why? Price. Well, it's expect. I said it on my Instagram. The price is expensive, but the price is right. He shows up. He gives any and every team that he plays for a chance to win. He's that good. I've seen it firsthand. Carey Price, he's good looking, he smells great, and he plays great. So I'm all about Carey Price. I'm on the price train. And going into the series, it gets interesting now. First of all, let's, let's recap the Pittsburgh series. 
I picked Pittsburgh to win this series because I ain't betting against the best player in the world in Sidney Crosby. And in my guess, they probably, listen, I think they were up 3-1. They blew yeah, a 3-1 lead. Tough breaks. Well, that was the, that was the game changer for yep. them. And yes, Carey Price was the X factor in the series. There's no doubt about it. But you have to give credit to the players that stepped up in that game in particular because Price didn't score those goals. You know, you have to look at Paul Byron, veteran player, Shea Weber, veteran player, Jeff Petrie, uh, veteran player, Ben Sherratt, veteran player. You know, guys who have who have played in the playoffs understand it. They stepped up and they were good when they needed to be good. Um, that was their best moment. Going in, uh, listen, I picked Pittsburgh because I'm not betting against the best player in the world. But if you look at Pittsburgh's team, uh, you know, even playing against them when I was in Jersey, we lost to them in the Stanley Cup final with Nashville. It ain't the same team. It's not the same team. And, you know, I think that there's not as much depth there. I still think their core group of players are still elite, but it's a different team. So, you know, I think that for that series, they have some time to think about it and regroup as a team. But I think that Montreal was the better team in the series. I think they played better. Listen, moving to Philly, though, you look at the Flyers. This is going to be a good series. I think this is going to be a really good series. It's going to be very difficult to predict because you got Carter Hart, who's a young goaltender, very similar path to Carey Price, you know, being young, starting off in an organization, really coming in and establishing himself as the number one goaltender there. You got Carey Price on the other end. Carter Hart's probably looking at the other end being like, I want to have this guy's career or somewhat of it. So it'll be an interesting series was watching them go back and forth. But you look at it, Philly's D, in my opinion, has been outstanding the right. way that they've moved the puck, the way they've defended. Provorov, obviously a stud back there. Don't, very, very don't good. Don't give away too much because we're going to get into your predictions on this series coming up. Okay. But, All that, right. but All that, right. that was a really nice tease. Listen. There, stick around because okay. in about 15 minutes, you're going to get the, the full cake right there. Okay. All right. All right. Number eight, Calgary Flames beating the, the Winnipeg Jets three games to one. Obviously, the Jets came back, won an emotional game two after the big Shifley, you know, injury in the game one. What are your thoughts kind of on that series and how Calgary looked? Listen, it made it tough for us in Nashville when we lost Kevin Fiala and Ryan Johansson going into the Stanley Cup final. Whenever you lose top forwards like that, it's very, very difficult. It's not doesn't mean you can't win. It's just very, very difficult. And when you look at we, we lost... Johansson in the Anaheim series, which was the conference final series. We lost Fiala against St. Louis. We kind of got to the Stanley Cup finals without those two being, well, Johansson, we lost later in the Anaheim series. So he, he played a little bit more than Fiala did. But when you go into a series without your top forwards, it makes it very difficult. So I'm not surprised at the outcome there. I think that for Winnipeg, they're happy of how they bounce back. Maybe not happy in how this, the series ended, but it's very, very tough to, to win without Patrick Liney and Shifley in the lineup. I mean, that's... 16 goals by by the Flames. Are You think their offense is going to continue into the next series? Well, listen, Johnny Goudreau, Sean Monaghan, Kachuk, these are guys, young players that are hungry, that want to take that next step. Um, I think that they're going to score goals. Uh, you know, it's... Listen, Calgary is one of those teams that wants to make the next step. Johnny Goudreau has some confidence. I think that for them, confidence is huge. They're, they're a great team. I mean, obviously, confidence is huge for everyone, but specifically for them, when they play with that confidence, I think Kachuk now putting the whole skate thing behind him, just focusing on playing hockey, is going to allow them to elevate their game. He stepped up. Um, I, I like Calgary moving in into that round, but I, I, I think they're going to score goals. I, I don't think they're going to have a problem. Seven New York Islanders beat Florida Panthers three games to one. Yeah. Thoughts on that series? You called this one. I did. I said that the Islanders uh, were going to win this series, and I think it was pretty clear. Um, they're just so well coached. They were disciplined throughout the series, and they found their legs. You could see Pajot scoring some big goals, getting like just integrating himself. It's tough too because they have, and a big win for them is getting bars all going towards the end of that series. They got everybody going now, and that's huge in the playoffs. You need that. And I talked about it on the, on episode one is that some teams are got are getting it going now. Some teams are struggling to kind of get it going, but it seems the Islanders are finding it at the right time. I think they're a dangerous team too, like Carolina. They're going up against Washington. We'll get into that later. Panthers fired GM Dale Talon following the loss. Rough one there. 11 Arizona Coyotes 
beat the Nashville Predators, your old team, three games to one. Thoughts on that? That was well, rough. Listen, I, and I said this before the series. I said, Darcy Comfort, if he plays, listen, he was phenomenal. He was big when he needed to be. He bounced back when he had adversity. I think he's a huge reason. Nashville was peppering him too. Lots of shots on net. It's a tough loss for Nashville. You know, I know that this is a team that's been trying to get over the hump. Obviously, I played yeah. there for the past couple of years. It's a good group of guys. Listen, they threw everything they could at him. It just didn't happen. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens moving forward. But it's that's a tough loss. It's tough losing in the playoffs, man. It's not easy. It's tough. You know, they almost pushed it to game five, right? They took yeah. game four into OT. Yeah. They just lost there in the first couple seconds. Coyotes... I mean, they lost there after, you know, several, you know, 10 minutes into the OT. Coyotes were gritty. And for a team yeah. where their GM just quit right before the bubble happened, does when something like that happens, does it galvanize a team together when you have some adversity like that where a GM quits before you even enter into a playoff situation? Well, listen, I, you know, I compare them kind of to like Montreal in a certain way. Stepping into that series, everybody's picking Nashville to beat them. You know, they got guys that have something to prove. You know, Phil Kessel getting an opportunity away from Pittsburgh to prove again that he can step up and elevate his game. Taylor Hall, a guy who's, you know, played in New Jersey the past couple of years, gets an opportunity to play in the playoffs, shows up. I thought he was huge for their team. I thought he played very, very well. Um, I thought he was gritty. He showed some tenacity. But it's now it's the playoffs. It's tough to do that series to series. They did it in that series. They're going to have to continue it to have success in the playoffs. They can't take their foot off the gas. You know, um, very similar to Columbus. Columbus has to play a certain way to have success. I think that that's got to be consistent with, with Arizona as well. And Clayton Keller, a young player, stepped up, played well. I, I like where their team's going. But you could tell they were getting stronger and getting – they were like this as the series yeah. went on. You know, it was – adversity didn't – didn't affect their team at all. Uh, that's really, really important in the playoffs. Says a lot about their coaching staff and their leaders. Blackhawks beat the Oilers three games to one. Exciting series. Lots of gold scores. I think we had 31 total goals scored during the series. Thoughts on that? I didn't want to bet against the second best player or the best player in the league in Connor McDavid and Dreisaitl. I thought that those guys, I mean, Connor McDavid was phenomenal. Yeah. But it goes, it's like, it's just like Toronto. They're, Austin Matthews was phenomenal. It's, it's a team, it's a team game. Everybody's got to elevate, you know, to have success in the playoffs. But for me on the Blackhawks, the one player that stepped up and was huge, Corey Crawford was great, Jonathan Taves. I mean, he elevated his game. I'm telling you, I'm saying this again, he's going to be a problem. He's going to be a problem to deal with because right. when he gets that confidence and he starts playing that way and he's cycling pucks down low and he's using his body and he's got the confidence and he's, listen, he's unbelievable in the face-off circle. He's got that look in his eyes. He competes. I played against him in the playoffs before. I expect him to have another big series and it's going to be tight against Vegas, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But I like Chicago and the way they're playing right now. What do you think about the rookie Kubelik stepping up Having a huge game one, stole a game but there. But it starts with the veteran players. It starts with Duncan Keith, Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves setting the tone. Everybody's following their lead. They know that these guys have won before. They know what it takes. And you can see it. It's a trickle-down effect. I haven't spoken to my brother yet, but I'm sure if I speak to him, that's what he's going to tell me. These guys understand what it takes to win. And it's been a couple years where they haven't had this opportunity Trust me, they're thirsty, they're hungry. You know Patrick Kane, he's always hungry. Uh, number seven, Vancouver beats in the number 10 Minnesota Wild three games to one. Canucks run off three wins in a row after being shut out in game one. That was huge. It was a good series. It was a good se series. Um, I thought that Vancouver uh, played very, very well. I thought Minnesota played well as well. Kevin Fiala was a stud throughout the series, obviously huge. Um, that series could have won any either way, but... I think Vancouver stuck to the plan. There's a lot of pressure on them, and they stepped up. They elevated their game. You see in guys like Miller blocking shots. They were committed to winning, and, you know, we're going to see. That has to continue, but it's got to be a good feeling for that team to go through that. Brock Besser, I did an interview with him before the series. I said he was going to score some big goals. He stepped up, had a huge presence, so I like Vancouver. All right, and the number eight Toronto beats the nine Columbus, uh, but we have a special guest to – to bring us into that game. Oh, do we ever. Eighth-seeded Toronto Maple Leaf loses to the ninth-seed Columbus Blue Jackets three games to two, an exciting series. Here to talk about the series is Toronto Maple Leaf superfan and fellow YouTuber, 
Steve Dangle. Steve, after last night's loss, how you holding up, bud? Tell and, and tell me, what is the feeling in the GTA right now? I know you're in Oshawa. What's the feeling in Toronto and the greater Toronto area today? I, it's, <laughs> I can tell the, the Habs fan growing up in you is just adoring this, I, loving hold this. Hold on, hold on. Actually, I, I got to be honest. I like Toronto. I like their team. I like Austin Matthews. I was, listen, I think people are going to be a lot harder on them than they should be. Their top players worked really, really hard. It's yeah. not like they didn't show up. So you can't do that. It's just, they're expected to win and it just didn't happen. So uh, it's not like I'm rooting for Columbus to beat them. I think it was a good test. I want to hear what you think though, Steve, you're the Leafs fan born and bred. You're the you, dangle. Where you at? Come on. I want to hear from you, man. Here, here's where I'm at. And and a lot of people were like, uh, uh, after they saw my video from last night, they're like, oh, okay, this is bad, actually. Because I, I blew up last year. Because I thought through five games against Boston, mm -hmm. they were the better team. And they were up 3-2. They had two chances to finish them. Game six, they had a chance to finish them on home ice. They blew that. And game seven, I thought, was their worst game in the series. So there was a lot of anger after that loss because it was like they had them and they just couldn't pull it off. With this year against Columbus and the 70 games that came before that, right? Because everyone's like, oh, you can't just base it on a five-game series. With the series against Columbus and the 70 games that came before that, there was this weird peace, I felt, because – it seemed obvious to me that, oh, they're just not good enough. You know what I mean? So last year it seemed like, oh, maybe if they just change this or that, or they like these little tinkering changes, it doesn't feel like that anymore. It kind of feels like they done goofed and some heads might roll. For listeners who don't know, Steve is the author of This Team is Ruining My Life, But I Love Them. <laughs> After the heartbreaking loss, Steve, there's the book. Go out and get it, fans. Uh, do you still love them today? Do you still love them today? Man, but first of all, I got to say, I was on the bestsellers list. I mm. fell off, and then they lost game seven to Boston. And I went right back on. And I checked today, and it's number one on Amazon for hockey books in Canada. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I'd much rather them still be in the playoffs, though. Uh, you know I'm going to be back, PK. Okay, like, I can never, I can never leave my team. No, there's no question. But let's hold on for a second. Let's let's keep it real here, okay? And it's one of my questions. I'm going to get to it later. But, dude, Tavares hits the post, right? Oh. No, no, no. Hold on. So let's talk about it because no, everybody wants to just look at the whole game and look at the score. And they lost. They got shut out. And that's not the story of the game. The story of the game. There were opportunities. It just did. There's no puck luck. They needed some puck luck. Maybe they got all that puck luck in the comeback win. Maybe that's where it all came, but they needed some bounces. And let's be honest, Corpusalo, Austin Matthews in the slot. Like Austin Matthews shoots that puck 50 more times in the back of the net. Like it, these are bounces that they just didn't get. So let, you got to call it what it is. Corpusalo stood on his head. He played very, very, very well. Um, I don't know. I give I give the Leafs. I got a sensitive spot for that team because they're young group. They're good kids. They work hard. So, but hold on. Let's get into it a little bit more. Game one, sure. Jackets shut Leafs out two nothing. Right. Game two, Leafs shut out Jackets three nothing. Game three, Leafs blew a three nothing lead. Game four, the Jackets blew a three nothing lead with three and a half minutes left. What were your expectations going into game five? What did you think was going to go down? Because I I gotta be honest with you. There was no way I was making a prediction on anything. I stopped after the first couple of games of playoffs. I just, I said, you know what? For all these hockey analysts out there that get chirped in the locker room and at lunch, I, I'm not chirping anybody anymore because you can't, you can't. There's so much parody. But what did you think? What did you think about game five? I don't know how anyone makes any money betting on hockey. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> Vegas makes it to the final in their first year. Like, like what, what do you, how, I know. who calls that? I know. You know Vegas almost went broke uh, because of that. But, Honestly, watching them, uh, they get shut out the first game. I'm like, you know what, though? If they just switch it up, I bet they chip away and they score. Game two, they finally did. Mm -hmm. They almost get shut out in game four, an elimination game, and somehow they turn that into 
uh, three goals in four minutes. And then they get shut out in an actual elimination game. So my optimism that if they just keep chipping away, keep chipping away, keep chipping away, it just wasn't rewarded in an elimination game. And it's just like, uh, you know, what I was saying with the previous 70 games. I PK, I, all I've been doing all quarantine is watching reruns. And last night I saw another one. And <laughs> I don't know how many more I can take. Okay, so what do you think they could have done differently? Like, what do you think? You're watching the game. You've wa- you watch them all year. Me specifically, yeah. obviously, I'm focused on my team. To be during the season, I don't watch a lot of hockey unless it's like a rivalry game and something happened before, and I right. want to get the scoop, right? But you're watching the Leafs all the time. So what mm. what do they got to do differently? Tell me. I want to know. What do you think? <sighs> what What was interesting. So Sheldon Keefe was getting called out a little bit because he made some weird decisions, right? Like he threw Andreas Janssen in after many months of not playing. Uh, He loaded up the big line. He put Willie at center, which there's not many games this season where he began the game and played the entire game at center. You know, maybe he did it in a pinch if if someone got hurt. What that game seemed like to me uh, wasn't really a what could they have done differently. It seemed like the Leafs organization kind of throwing the players into a sink or swim scenario because PK sometimes like for example, 2016, 17, the kids are playing great. How do they award them? You know what? We're going to go out at the deadline. We're going to get Brian Boyle to help the group. And we're going to make a run at the playoffs this year. you know what their final game before the trade deadline was PK? What? They lost to the emergency backup. (laughs) And Kyle Dubas said nuts to this. So what I think they did in game five was they were like, all right, we want to see what the big line can do going forward. It was a test for the rest of the lineup. That's why Andreas Janssen was thrown in there because he deserves that shot before they make any evaluations in the off season. And I think they failed. You know what? I think that when I watched it, I watched closely in game five. Um, You know, obviously I know John Tavares very well. Played with them, World Juniors. I've known them since I was, you know, I mean, since we were kids. Our, our parents went to school together. I've seen the pictures. I watched closely JT. I watched Austin Matthews. I watched Mitch Marner. I watched their core guys, right? Morgan mm-hmm. Riley. Those guys left it all on the ice. Like, I, I'm being honest. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating it. I don't have any reason to sugarcoat anything. I'm watching they're trying their absolute hardest. Nobody was lagging. I'm watching their back checking. Guys are trying to block shots. Guys are getting in kitchens. They're four checking hard. It's just, you watch these two teams and how they played. I watched that second goal and how it came for Columbus. They had full possession at the blue line. He fake turned up. I can't remember who the player was. He fake turned up and he weeks. No, it wasn't Foodie. Foodie was on the far side. This was on the bench side. I can't remember who the puck was. It could have been Dubois, but it didn't matter who it was because they all play the same way. They all they all understand. They get into that area. He tight turns, weak side rims it so that Foodie can pick it up on the other side. But the defenseman was pulled so far to the middle. That's why Foodie had so much time to walk in. So I, I think that in a series like that, it's going back and forth, back and forth. You knew it was going to come down to one play like that. And think about all the grade A scoring chances that the Leafs had. It took a smart weak side rim around the boards to create a little bit of time and space, a little bit of miscommunication in the D zone because of where guys were coming from. There was line changes, just a little bit of time and space. And just like that, that's the game. I, you know, I think it's very, very tough to evaluate the whole team. I think their star players are still, I mean, watching them move the puck around though, man, on the power play, like, they're unreal. They're, no, they're unreal. They're, there's no, I haven't seen a team do that, move the puck like they've moved the puck in a long time. So there's still a fun team to watch. Okay, let's get down to it though in the series that I think the deciding factor, 33 shots, absolute wall, Corpus Allo. I mean, you can't get a puck past them, but everybody's going to look at the Leafs. You got to look at Columbus and the factors that help them win. Yes, the way they play, they played together. All four lines are playing the same style of hockey making sure pucks get deep, very disciplined, hard checking, four checking, blocking shots, the Tortorella style. But at the end of the day, Corpus Allo made huge, 
huge saves and was, was a rock in net. So in my opinion, that's the difference. Listen, it's been 16 years, 16 years since the Leafs have won a playoff series. Do you have hope for the, for next year? How dare you? Well, hold on. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm on a podcast here. I'm not chirping. It's listen to me. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> listen, the NHL is a hard league to win in, man. Pittsburgh goes down to Montreal. Oh, yeah. It's not easy to win. I don't care. I don't care who you got on your team. It, you need mm -hmm. some bounces, man. Listen, a bounce one way or the other way, Toronto's up 3-1 in that game. And then it's a different game. Tavera scores on that empty net. If it doesn't hit the post, it's a completely different game. And those are bounces you need. So, PK, the, Toronto's number one export is smog. Its second is ifs. <sighs> And it feels like that's all we've had, man. When is it going to be them? When is it going to be that? You can't tell me. Let, PK, I told you, okay, okay, you haven't had the internet for the past two weeks, right? You haven't had the internet for the okay. past two weeks. I told you there was a team that blew a 3 nothing lead and lost. And then the next game, they overcame a 3 nothing deficit and won. You know it's the Leafs before I tell you. Okay, but... I tell you a team lost I'm to an emergency you, backup. You know it's the Leafs before I listen, tell you. Listen, listen, The emergency backup... Carolina's a good team. Carolina's sure. a very good team. Carolina... Goons is a good team. Carolina just swept the New York Rangers. Listen to me. Carolina is a real deal team. So sure. before we even get into the goaltending thing, that's a very, very... That's a top... That's a top 10 team in the league. That's a top, possibly top five team when they're playing the way that they want to play. So I, there's, I'm not going to talk about that game. But what I will talk about is this. Them coming back after being up, or was it they blew a three-goal lead, or Columbus, yes, they blew a three-goal lead to Columbus. Yep. And then when Columbus was up, come back and beat them. To me, that says more about the Toronto Maple Leafs right now as a team and that they're closer to making that jump than a lot of people. A lot of people are going to try to find and pick holes with them. I think they're closer to making that jump than not. I think that, to me, I watched that game and I said, okay, th these guys, they care. They, they're, making, they're, they're learning still, man. You got to lose before you can win. Like, it's every team. They're a young team. They're coming together. They got a good core. I, I Listen, I, I, I'm more optimistic about the Toronto Maple Leafs. That's me. That's me. PK, what's what's the most important thing to have on a hockey team? A good right-handed defenseman. Am I right? I, <laughs> but like, the, on that heading note, into next year, on he, heading into next year, they got a lot of questions. Steve, we're definitely going to have you back on, and we're going to be talking Leafs for sure. Steve Dangle, ladies and gentlemen, to all my Ugly Duck podcast fans, Subaniacs watching, please thank Steve Dangle for coming and make sure you subscribe. Steve Dangle is a good man. I've known you for a while, Steve. It's nice ha having you on the show. Thank you for coming on my podcast, man. Hey, thanks for having me. S since the Nike days, we got to get hooked up with free shoes again. Well, listen, I'm three stripes now. Maybe I can get you some nice three stripes. Sound I good? I saw your IG today. I was like, oh, okay. Snap, hey, snap, snap. Keys. Steve Dangle, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Steve. Sweet dreams, buddy. Thanks. <laughs> now let's jump into PK's bed. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> no, before we do that, let's have you go. Oh. <laughs> and you know what? I'm one of those guys that's in the locker room being like, what's this guy talking about? He doesn't know what he's talking about picking that team. <laughs> well, you say it with such conviction, too. That's why, but that's why it's so much fun. The fans will love it. Okay, so do you want to jump into my picks or do you want to expose my picks? <laughs> he wants to expose me. Yeah, no, he wants to expose it. It's the exposure. It's crazy. Uh, all right, look, before we get into yep. the quarterfinal, right, picks here, yeah. let's just look back. Yeah, at, you want to go back. At yeah. some of these qualifying picks, right? In the West, you were 0-4. Yep. Uh, in the East, a little two bit better, four. two for four, yep. right? You were right on Carey Price. But you were wrong with picking Pitt. You picked Carolina and you picked the Islanders. I said why I picked Pitt. You did. I picked Pitt because I, I ain't betting against Sidney Crosby in a playoff series. I'm not doing it until he retires. Right. It ain't going to happen. You were right on Columbus, right? Yep. But you went with the Leafs. Okay, but I also, I'm a fan of the Leafs. I like the way their team plays. You know, I was hoping to see them make that jump. I guess a part of me likes, wants to see them get in some kitchens. And I want to see 
them make that jump. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's difficult. Everybody wants to see them fail, right. you know? So it's just, that's why I picked Toronto. I, I think that they're closer to making that jump than not. So look, now, uh, look, I don't think anyone really knew what to expect going into the bubble, right? Yep. Obviously, some teams were able to show up. Some teams didn't. Now we have enough tape on everybody. Yep. So these predictions moving forward for the conference quarterfinals, both for the East and the West, we're going to hold you to these. You you now have enough footage, and I'm I'm thinking you're gonna at least nail seventy five percent of these. Okay, you don't want me to go with any bias this time. <laughs> true picks. We want true picks. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. We're okay. gonna go to the West first, right? With your brother's team, the number one Golden Knights versus the number eight Chicago Blackhawks. Who do you have? I'm gonna go with the Golden Knights. And if you want me to be biased, I would say the Chicago Blackhawks because my brother's on that team. But watching Golden Knights come out, watching them come out of the round robin, they're a hot team right now. They're confident. They're goaltending. They're getting great goaltending. Their defense looks good. The biggest thing that I'm doing here is I'm going with the veteran defense. Golden Knights has more of a veteran defense than Chicago. I think that in a seven, it's different now. It's a seven game series. It's not a five game series. So I'm going with the experience on the back end. I think that defense is always going to win in the playoffs. I'm going with the Golden Knights. But listen, Chicago Blackhawks, Jonathan Taves is going. If Taves and Kane and their power play and special teams picks up, I think that this is going to be, it's going to be a tough series either way. They're both going to compete. Crawford's playing well. But if I'm looking at experience, I'm looking at a team in a seven-game series, I'm going with the Vegas Golden Knights. Number two, Colorado Avalanche versus the number seven Phoenix Coyotes. Who do you well, have? Well, we listen, the Rocket Net, Darcy, if he plays well, you know, I, I like Arizona's chances, but I think that Colorado's just way too deep. I mean, they got that thoroughbred galloping through the neutral zone in uh, you know, Nathan McKinnon. I think that he's gonna be hyped up, he's gonna be ready to go. Uh, I don't see Colorado losing in in the quarterfinals. Don't Colorado's your pick, right? For the whole th behind St. Louis is is your number two pick for the whole thing. You want to go that far? No, back, no, huh? we don't. We don't. But but but, but we're they're call in that, that group. Yeah, they're in my. They're one of my picks. Yes. Number three, Dallas Stars versus the number six, Calgary Flames. Well, this is tough. Um, Ty, there's some question marks around Tyler Sagan. Is he yeah. in? Is he not? Ben Bishop. Is he in? Is he out? Dallas Stars haven't really elevated their game, particularly in the round robin. So uh, there's a lot of question marks here. I think Calgary is moving in the right direction right now. They're coming off an emotional series. Um, but make no doubt about it, the Dallas Stars is a team that can come out of the West. This is a very, very, very tough pick. Very tough pick. Flames played well in that first series oh, against Winnipeg. It's a tough one. I'm going with the Dallas Stars. Oh, I'm going with Dallas. You're going. You're you're picking. Yep. I think Seggy. I think I think Dallas is going to come out. Yep. All right. There we go. Number four, St. Louis Blues. Your pick to take it all versus the number five, Vancouver Canucks. I'm Who do going, you have? I'm going. Listen, and this there's no easy picks. I'm going with St. Louis. That's my team that I picked to be there. But with the way Vancouver's playing right now, Vancouver Vancouver's can make it a series. Maybe they'll win the series. I'm going with St. Louis. Well, you went all favorites in the West. Here's what I will give you, right? We'll, I'm just going to add this in here as a little fun one. Yep. We'll call it the Bazinga bonus. Of, of the four teams that you picked to lose, right, if you could pick one of these to take the whole thing as a Cinderella story, who would be it? A team to take the whole thing. That yeah, I if any to of lose. these, whether it's the, the first black, four of the of the, the of the four losers in the West that you think the Blackhawks, the Coyotes, the Flames, the Canucks that you see maybe going home early in these first series. If there was one of those four teams, if they if somehow everything right happened, they could have a chance to win it all. Who would be the one kind of bazinga bonus here that we'll call out? I think. Calgary. All right. You heard it here. They could be the Cinderella story. We're circling it. All right, moving to the East. Number one, Philadelphia Flyers look great versus the Montreal Canadiens. It's going to be a great series. 
It's going to be a great series. This is a very tough pick. Very tough pick. I'm going to break it down. Let's go. Special teams. Philly's got, in my opinion, better power play. Um, Carter Hart's a very good goaltender. Obviously, they're going to have to neutralize the big shot from Shea Weber at the top because that's, in my opinion, the biggest factor on the power play. Philly's got a really good power play. I think it's going to be very tough to defend against. So it's going to come down to special teams. Philly's goaltending's good. Their D are playing great. The one thing about Philly where I give them an advantage is I feel that their D are a little bit more active. And it's very, very tough to defend against that. But that also opens you up for more odd man rushes. Their defense are young. It's going to come down to decision making. They've made all the right decisions in the round robin. There's a little bit more pressure in this series now. As you get closer and closer to the final, right. I'm going to go in a seven game series. I'm going with Philly. Wow. Who do you think has the, the better series there, Hart or Price? I think Carey Price is going to play out of his mind. I think he's going to play extremely well. I think Montreal is going to play extremely well. I don't see them. I only see them getting better. The younger players gaining confidence. They're fast. They're quick. They check hard. That's a tough series, but I'm going with Philly. All right. Number two, Tampa Bay Plus, Lightning. Pricey plays better when I bet against him. So. <laughs> Obviously, right? Uh, number two, Tampa Bay Lightning versus the, third, uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets. What are your thoughts here? Does Columbus continue? Uh, th that could very well happen. I think it comes down to, well, look at this. Stamkos and Root are possibly out for Tampa. Yeah, that's rough. I'm going to go with Columbus. I'm taking Columbus. I don't know why. I'm taking Columbus. Corpusalo? I'm just taking Columbus. Got it. I'm going to go Columbus. All right, you heard it here. That's that's the first time in this entire series you've picked the dog, right? But obviously, if if those players are out for Tampa, then you know Columbus is probably going to be favored in that series. Number three, Washington Capitals versus the number six New York Islanders. Who do you have? Islanders. Wow. Let's get into it. You Why so? Get into that? Yeah, let's get into that one a little bit. Well, listen, I like to get in kitchens too, <laughs> so I'm going to buzz a couple towers. I'm going with the Islanders. I think. Ovechkin's going to elevate his game. I I think that they're a little bit thin on the back end right now. Um, who knows about John Carlson's, I don't know what his status is. Obviously, he's, you know, probably going to either win the Norris or come close to winning it. Um, so he's a big deal, but not playing in those games, I think it's going to be tough for him to come back in. So I'm going to go with the Islanders. I think Islanders are going to be a very, very, very tough team to beat um, with how they play. And they're going to make, New York, I'm sorry, they're going to make Washington go a full 200 feet to score goals. And in a game, in a seven game series, if the Islanders play that way, the way that they've played all season, I think they're going to be very, very tough to beat. Let's touch base on Ovechkin just because we haven't really yeah. touched on him so far in these playoffs. What are your thoughts on playing against him? Obviously, there's a lot of pressure for him coming into the league. He got the monkey off his back by finally winning uh, a championship there for Washington. He's he's a gritty player, great scorer. Thoughts there? I, well, I mean, I look at Ovechkin just like how I look at Crosby. I mean, you just never bet against those guys because if they get the bounces, and I talk about the bounces, not meaning that they need luck to win, but when you couple their talent and their strengths in their game and how much better they are than a lot of players in the league with the bounces – they're almost impossible to beat, right? You give those guys bounces, they're going to bury you every time. So Washington has that, but I think with Lars Eller being out of the bubble, having his, it's their depth. There's questions around their depth. And in the playoffs, that's what, went, that's what won them the Stanley Cup was their depth, right? So you need to have depth. I think the Islanders are a well-oiled machine. I think that they're playing well. I think they got gained a lot of confidence throughout the series in Florida. They just didn't win. They got more and more people involved. I think they're going to be tough to beat in a seven-game series. I'm going with the Islanders. All right. Number four, Boston Bruins versus the number five, Carolina Hurricanes. Who do you have? I, I think that this is going to be an, this is going to be unbelievable. Aho. Nasty. Williams. Spetschnikov. 
nasty Williams game seven. Hey, Bruins fans, I'm going with the Hurricanes. Woo, you know, Hurricanes, that's my pick to take it all. I, and I, I'm not going to disagree with you on that. Right. I ain't disagreeing with you on that. You think Williams opens up game one with another fight just to set the tone? Well, if he does, don't fight Chara. <laughs> don't fight that guy. <laughs> well, you heard it here. Look, we have all the picks in right now. Yep. Looks like in the West, you went mostly with the favorites. In the East, other than Philly, you went with the underdog seeds. So let's see how you do this time around. All right. Let's see. All right. Uh, and just like we did last time and for the East, right? If there's one team that you picked that lost, that could be a dark horse team that wins it all out of the Canadians, the Tampa Bay, the Washington Capitals, and the Bruins, who's that one dark horse team that could win it all? Let me take a close look here before I make my uh, pick. Where is it? I, I know where you have a close tie where you might have a the heartstrings pulled for a team. Uh, listen to me. Montreal could go all the way. <laughs> like, let's be honest. Let's like, go. Carey Price, like, you're not. When that guy's confident, right. man, he's hard to beat. We'll put them in as your Bazinga bonus. I'm putting them in as a Bazinga bonus. All right. Because, because I do feel that they can beat Philly. Yeah. They, like, I can't say that about a lot of teams. They can beat Philly. You know, they can beat Philly. I just, for Carter Hart, it would be awesome for him to go up against Carey Price um, and do it. But I don't know. It's going to be a lot of pressure, man. That's it's, It gets really good this round. The picks are in. Let's see what happens. The picks are in. He is one of the most successful producers in the world. Maybe the greatest producer of all time. Responsible for some of the greatest blockbuster films and TV shows from Beverly Hills Cop and Top Gun to Armageddon, Bad Boys. I'm looking at the list here. Pirates of the Caribbean, CSI, and The Amazing Race. The list goes on and on. Now, he's taking on hockey as co-owner of the 32nd NHL franchise for Seattle, The Kraken. Ladies and gentlemen, Subaniacs, Ugly Duck fans watching, please welcome Mr. Jerry Bruckheimer. Thanks for coming on the Ugly Dog Podcast. Jerry, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and be able to talk to you, even from afar. I assume you're in Toronto, but I'm not sure. I am not. I'm actually in L.A. Are you in L.A.? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm here in L.A. I actually moved out here full-time uh, two summers ago, um, but Lindsay and I just got a place, so we've been here since April. We waited two weeks in Jersey, came out here. So I've been here. This is the podcast. It's right here. The studio is in my garage. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah, Fantastic. So, well, listen, Jerry, I'm so excited to have you on. Um, sure. Truly is an honor. Uh, and I, I really respect you for doing this. Thank you so much. Um, Jerry, you're responsible for some of the greatest films, TV series of all time. But Jerry, you didn't start out in film. You grew up in Detroit and you were an active member of the Stamp Collecting Club which is a completely different conversation, a whole other conversation that we'll get into maybe at a different time. After college, you worked in advertising, advertising and your passion was photography. Tell us a little bit about your path and how did the early professions, your, your early professions, prepare you for being a, a movie producer? Well, I guess I was a collector from a, from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And then as, as I got older, I started to collect really talented people around me. And that's the key to my success. No matter where I've gone or what I've done, I've always found people that made me look good and were much more talented than I am. So that is part of my movie career, my TV career, and hopefully my hockey career. I know we've put together a, a fantastic group of great, great executives in Seattle, and I'm just thrilled. I'm lucky to have uh, an, an owner like David Bonderman working mm -hmm. with us. He's, uh, you know, he's the Wayne Gretzky, uh, Mario Lemieux of finance, and he's a fantastic owner. Uh, bringing in Todd Lewicki and Tim Lewicki, uh, building the arena with Oakview Group. Uh, I think we got the all-star all-star combination. And, you know, you, then you have uh, Ron Francis, you know, Hall of Famer, who built uh, the Carolina Hurricanes mm -hmm. as our general manager. So, you know, it's the same thing. I started collecting stamps, and then I, I found really talented people on my way up both here in Hollywood and wherever I, when I was in New York and advertising, I found very talented writers and directors to work with me. 
um, you know, we collect talent. Well, you do. And you're very, very good at it, Jerry. My dad actually told me, because I think he hit the nail right on the head. My dad says, PK, the time that comes when you're the smartest person in the room is the time that you're not getting ahead. So you always have to surround yourself with talented and smart people. So uh, I'm on the same page as you, Jerry. Jerry, looking back, you went from kind of being you know, someone who was somewhat unknown, you know, in the industry to one of the most powerful men in Hollywood. How did you make a name for yourself? And what was the biggest life changing moment for you? You know, I think you make a name for yourself by your work. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the work, you know, built on all these talented writers and directors and studio executives I lucky enough to work with through my career. And they made me famous. Uh, it's, it's always the work. You, you know, it's the same thing in hockey. You yeah. do the work. You yeah. win cups. It's really hard work and you got to commit to it. You got to fight through it all. And that's what we do. I always was one of the hardest working people wherever I went. So when I started in the mailroom, I took the weekend runs. When everybody was out with their girlfriends or going to ball games, I was driving executives around or I was picking up packages or whatever it was. I always took dirty work. But you know what? That's how you get ahead. You know what, Jerry? That is that's. Such great insight because part of the reason of why I started this podcast is for my fans to have insight to that. We have some very young people in, in my audience and my following and providing them that insight is exactly what I want people to be able to take away from the guests that we bring on because I'm very lucky to, to have people like yourself on, Gary, uh, in our, our, our first episode. So I think that that is, is, is so strong of a point. Um, Jerry, in hockey... A loss can be really challenging to come back from. Were there any flops in your career? Because you have such a long list of successful movies and shows. And, uh, you know, how did you bounce back from those flops or those losses? You know what it is? You learn more from the ones that don't work than you do from the ones that do work. Mm. And, th and that's the same thing in sports. You know, you learn a lot when you have a season that, that is not what you thought it would be. So it's the same thing with Hollywood. You know, you make a film or a TV show that doesn't captivate an audience and you say, well, how, how did we do this wrong? What did we do? You examine it and hopefully you're better for the next one. Well, that's it, right? I, I, I Watching The Last Dance, um, you know, and watching Michael Jordan and, and how he sort of maneuvered his way through his career. And you watch some of these top athletes that have had to lose you know, have had to be beaten down, have had to make mistakes before they saw the ultimate success. So uh, you're spot on again. Uh, Jerry, you played a major part in breaking down color barriers in Hollywood. Bad Boys was arguably Will Smith's breakout film. And, you know, because I know he did about three films before Bad Boys, but Bad Boys was like the most well-known first film that he did. Um, and Beverly Hills Cop was one of Eddie Murphy's earliest hits. How did you know that those films would be such hits when the rest of Hollywood wasn't putting really putting black actors front and center? What kind of impact do you feel you had on on those guys careers? You know, it's it's again, it's like sport mm. sports. They're, it's talent. They were both enormously talented actors. Uh, and that's what it's all always about. It's always about talent, recognizing talent. Eddie Murphy was a fantastic talent. When we went to Paramount at the time. Uh, and said, we want Eddie Murphy in the picture. The conventional wisdom, not there, but around the community in Hollywood was no African-American actor had ever grossed more than $20 million. And that was mm -hmm. Richard Pryor. So Beverly Hills Cop went on to gross just in America over $200 million. And that was back in like 85 or 86. So again, it comes down to really talented people. And color has nothing to do with talent. Talent's everywhere. And I always look for great talent. We were very fortunate to be at the early part of both their, their careers, both Will and Eddie. It's awesome. Awesome stuff. Um, really, really, really powerful stuff. And those are some unbelievable movies. I, I think I've watched Bad Boys, the first Bad Boys. I, and I'm not joking, Jerry. I must have watched Bad Boys 1 and uh, Beverly Hills Cop 1. I must have seen those movies each over 50 times. I'm not even joking. At least 50 times. Unbelievable movies. I love it. Um, I know I'm not the only one, Jerry, uh, who is looking forward to the Top Gun sequel. Top Gun Maverick. What can you tell us and the fans about the movie? And how is it different from the original movie? 
Well, you know what? I, if you love the original, you're going to love this one even more. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's terrific. It's unfortunately, we can't bring it out until July, but that's the time it should be. It should be in the summer. It's a, it's a real wonderful summer movie going experience. And Tom Cruise is, you know, a superstar <laughs> in his world. And he still is. And he's the hardest working actor. You know, success doesn't come easy. And when you look at Tom's career and what he's done, he, this guy works 24-7. He'll call me at 4 or 5 in the morning ask, asking questions on what's going on. So when you have somebody who's that committed, you're very fortunate to be working with him. The successful people in Hollywood are usually the hardest working. And is it true about his stunts that he does all of his stunts? Like I, I, I've heard so many rumors that that he just wants to do everything. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Look, and he he's he's training right now for the Mission Impossible, and he'll mostly be trained for four or five months to do some of the stunts wow. that he's going to do in in the film. I have no idea what they are, but I, every time uh, I speak to him, he says, "Well, I just got finished work, do, working stunt work." So he's constantly training, constantly trying to make himself better and do the most outrageous, crazy stunts that he does do himself. Look, at we had him in an F-18, in the backseat of an F-18. And, you know, he's an avid pilot. He easily could have flown the plane, but the Navy <laughs> wouldn't allow that to happen. But, you know, he trained all our actors to fly. We started actors in, in, in prop planes. Then we put him in, a, in an aerobatic prop. Then we put him in a, in a jet. And then we put them in an F-18 so they can handle the G-forces. So when you see the movie, they're actually in these planes. They're feeling everything. And so is Tom. When you see these maneuvers that he coordinated and he did himself, all the flying sequences in there, along with our director, were done by Tom and the Navy and the Navy coordinators. We had their best pilots working with us, both male and female. We're very fortunate. Can you, can you compare stunt men and stunt women to professional athletes? Like, Can you compare them? Absolutely. They're, they're excellent at what they do. They train very hard. It's, it's, it's a little different because even though hockey is a dangerous sport, what they do is even more dangerous. Uh, you know, they put their life on the line anytime they do a high fall or any, anything can go wrong. But usually they're, they're so well trained and they do the stunts over and over again before, before they actually uh, jump and do the, the thing on camera. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Hollywood and professional sports. Jerry have a lot of similarities. How do you feel about the moment that we're all living now? And do you feel hopeful for the future of the movie industry? Absolutely. I I think that once we have a vaccine and once people, you know, get smart and keep wearing these masks until we have a vaccine, just like you did in Canada, they have, they have great results because of what they did. Hopefully we'll do the same thing here. We get a vaccine. People are going to be dying to get out of their houses. They're, they're going to want to go to games. They're going to want to do do everything that they couldn't do for the last, what, five, six months. So I think it's going to be a big explosion once once this is under 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 underneath rather than being on top right now with this, with this pandemic. Jerry, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but bear with me. Is there any way I can get two tickets for Lindsay and I to the movie premiere when it comes out, please? Can I'll I get do my to- best? I can't promise you anything. Okay, 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 okay. No promises, but all right, no problem. <laughs> Jerry, I want to transition uh, for a second. You know, um, you're known for being a leader in the entertainment industry. You probably could have owned a team in any league, in any professional sports league. Where does your passion for hockey come from? Well, it comes from my roots. It was really from my dad. My dad, uh, you know, never really made a lot of money. He was, I mean, if he made four or $500 a week at the end of his, his uh, career, that was a lot. Mm-hmm. So we were a lower middle class family growing up in Detroit, in the city. I don't know if you saw the movie Eight Mile, where we mm-hmm. were living right near that area. So it wasn't a real glamorous upbringing. But my dad, whenever he got scraped enough money, or got a friend to give him a ticket to a Red Wing game, we'd be in the nosebleed section in the Olympia. But that grew my passion for the sport. Then I, when I was about 11, uh, I lived in, a, in, an, in an area where we could walk to a drive-in. And during the winter, the, the rows in between would freeze and we could play there. So we'd walk three blocks, carry our skates and our sticks and play in the, in the ruts of the drive-in. Uh, that, so that's where my passion grew. And when I was, I think I was 11 or 12, I joined a, I put together a peewee team. Again, I'm collecting. So I put together a bunch of neighborhood kids. 
uh, we got into a, uh, it was called Butzel Ice Rink in, in Detroit. I'm sure it's gone now. And we joined the league. Of course, we were terrible, but still it was so much fun to play and be out. There was an outdoor rink. So that was fantastic. I had to take a bus to get there with all my hockey gear when I was 11 or 12 years old. So that, that's where my passion grew. I was never very good. We didn't have a coach. We couldn't practice. Uh, but it was just getting out there and being fun. Then when I came to Hollywood, um, I didn't pick it up again. I, I was too busy trying to make a career. When Gretzky came here, uh, mm. he said, we'd met him, and he said, why don't you get tickets? We arranged for us to get tickets. So I started going to games, and I said, maybe I should start taking skating lessons. So I started taking skating lessons, and then I put together another group of guys here in Hollywood to start a skate. Yeah. And we've been doing that for, I bet you, over 25 years. Yeah. And I think you were part of it. I think you came out a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. Yes, I did. And I'm looking for, listen, I, I, we were going to get into that later, Jerry, but no, definitely. And I, I wanted to tell fans that, that that's the first time I met Jerry was, was at your skate. And I really enjoyed coming out there. It's always fun. It's always a great time. Jerry, back to Seattle. Seattle is a well doc is well documented as one of the ultimate close but no cigar bridesmaid American professional sports cities. Yet you and your Se Seattle hockey partners Jeremy Bonderman and Tim Lywicki um, somehow cracked the code in the NHL, um, cracked the code in the NHL and highly competitive uh, race to land what may be the final thirty second final NHL team of the Bettman Eight really because he had the eight expansion team so. You know, it might be the final expansion team in the Bettman era. Um, you know, roll out the world's greatest game in the Northwest. That's what you guys are doing. You're bringing the world's greatest game to the Northwest in Seattle and hockey. Have you had prior attempts at acquiring a sports team um, and, and being an owner? And how did those efforts color your decision in making process for the Seattle Kraken? Well, we started, I, I think, back in 06 or 07 when Pittsburgh was available. For a, for a moment, really, uh, uh, Pittsburgh was was going to be sold, and then they got Sidney Crosby, and they took it off the market. So we were talking <laughs> to them at the time, and then we talked to the Ducks when they yeah. became when Disney wanted to sell them. Yeah, uh, but that didn't work out. And then we actually made a deal with Gary to put a team in Vegas, and that was in '08. And then the market crashed, and we couldn't get an arena built. So we dropped out of there. But I always had my eye on Seattle from the very beginning. It's a great sports market. You look at the Seahawks. You, you look at the Sounders. You look at all, all the, the pro teams they have. They sell out. People love athletics there. And it's a competitive market. But I think it's going to be an explosion. As an example, we already had 51,000 people on a waiting list to buy tickets. We sold out. We sold out, I think, in the first 10 minutes when we put the tickets on sale. Yeah, I think it was, it says here, I got the rollout was commercially critically acclaimed 30,000 season ticket bids. Right. That was I in mean, the very beginning. But now since we, we unveiled the, the brand, it's even gotten hot, hotter. I mean, our sales for our, our hats and t-shirts, which is all going for a month to uh, uh, charities in, in the Seattle area, youth care and underprivileged communities. And we're raising an enormous amount of money. I, I think it, it takes you a couple of weeks even to get them, get the T-shirts and hats were sold out. So, and it, it, according to what I've read in the paper, we are four times what what Vegas got when they opened up as far as their merchandise. Wow, we we're one of the three or four top selling sports teams in merchandise, and you know we don't have a team. Jerry, I have a question for you. Another question. <laughs> Seattle Kraken, the Kraken. Does that have anything to do with the Kraken for the Pirates of the Caribbean? Because I can tell you this, Jerry, if I'm rolling into Seattle with the New Jersey Devils and we're playing the Kraken and your team plays anything like that thing does in the movie, I might be shaking in my hockey skates, Jerry. Well, look, we had a team that was put together uh, by some of uh, the, uh, <laughs> the owners of, of the Seattle Kraken right now that you know, decided what the colors were going to be, what the name was going to be, what the jersey was going to look like. I was part of that group, yeah. but I can't take credit for any of it. Uh, Andy Jazzy, from who works at Amazon, was a big part and big supporter of that name, as with David Bonner, because you know why? He was a fan favorite, and that's why. So we always honor the fans. 
Love that. Love that. And you know what, Jerry? I didn't touch on this before, but I want to touch on it again. I think that your story coming from humble beginnings is going to resonate very, very well with the NHL fa uh, fan base. You know, um, I, I hope that a lot of people get to see this interview and understand, you know, how you were brought up and where you came from, because I think that's very, very important for Seattle fans to know that about you. Um, Jerry, few NHL diehards know that the first U.S.-based Stanley Cup winner was the Seattle Metropolitans in 1917, disbanded in 1924. Seattle was then awarded an NHL franchise in June of 1974 to begin play in the bicentennial year 1976-77, but the league rescinded the invitation for a number of reasons, especially the on-ice woes and box office struggles of then-expansion Washington Capitals and the Kansas City Scouts. Fast forward to the Las Vegas Golden Knights, immediate competitive commercial created creativity and community success how has the las vegas golden knights and the bar that they set and what have you learned about vegas that you may apply to running your franchise well i think that comes down to to our our team and our hockey team we got right. great people running our hockey team mm -hmm. you know ron francis I, we're always under pressure to win everybody wants yeah. to win but the general managers of, of the other 31 teams or 30 teams that will draw are going to be a lot smarter than they and what they did with with Vegas They're, So it's going to be a whole different, different game this time than what Vegas had a little easier chore than we're, we're going to have. No question. And Jerry, I'm banking on that your pregame shows and your pregame, like Vegas did a really good job, but I'm assuming that Seattle's going to have the best pregame show in the league when well, the we're, season we're starts. We're certainly put to putting together a great team to do that. Yep. Yeah. They'll yep. come up with stuff just like they, our, our, our committee came up with the name and the colors and everything else. It was a, it was a group effort, but you got to have a great leader. And between David Bonderman and Todd, uh, we got a fantastic group. No question. No question. You touched on it earlier, Jerry, and I want to touch on it again. 32 years ago, yesterday, August 9th, 1988, the historic Wayne Gretzky, Edmonton Oilers, LA Kings block blockbuster trade sent shockwaves around North America and the world, forever altering the global hockey landscape. Where were you when you heard the news and how did you react to that? What year was that? I think it was 1988. 88, I was in California. Yep. It was really exciting because, you know, even though the Kings were a competitive team, mm -hmm. never really had the the audience that they deserved. That's because they had the Lakers, they had the Rams, they had all these other sports teams. Plus, you know, college, you know, UCLA, SC, there's so much sports in Southern California that a consumer can spend money on. So when you get Wayne here, he drew the crowds in. He, yeah. he built that franchise. Not only did he build the, the winning franchise in Los Angeles, the Sharks came out of that. I mean, a whole other teams, the Ducks. So it, it built the fever for hockey on the West Coast. So, Jerry, through this interview, you've talked a lot about teams. And it seems that that's going to be the theme for you guys is to do run your business by committee. So, you know, with three Kraken owners, yourself, David Bonnerman, Todd Lywicki, um, seems like you guys have three masterminds in finance, sports and entertainment. How do you think these skill sets will help you guys make this team a success? I know you talked about Ron Francis in the group, but just generally as generally as an organization, how do you feel that the three of you are going to really make this thing work possibly better than any other team? Well, it's not really the three of us. We have a lot of other investors who are mm -hmm. phenomenal, like Andy, uh, who are really smart. Uh, one of our investors is involved in the Major League Soccer there, uh, Adrian. So, you know, we have put together, or David really put together, a great team of owners. Uh, he's the lead owner, of course. But it all starts from the top, from him. And the fact that we're lucky enough to get Ron Francis, that's another you know, feather in, in David's hat and Todd's hat for luring him there. Uh, he, believe me, he had other offers. It, what, this wasn't his first, uh, first opportunity to go to another team after he left Carolina. Well, I think I, I speak on behalf of every fan in the NHL. I know as a player, I'm excited to see another team in the league. I've actually never been to Seattle. 
Never been to Seattle. So I'm excited to get to Seattle and see what that town's like. I've always been a fan of Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. So can't wait to get to Seattle and see the, the arena there. I hear it's beautiful. Jerry, if you got, we got about five minutes. I have some rapid fire questions for you, if you don't mind, before you go. Go for it. All right. Jerry, what keeps you up at night? Uh, failure. Mm. You know, you don't want to fail. You know, I worry about everything that I work on and uh, that's what keeps you up at night. I, you know, I think about how can we make things better? That's always the, the, can I work harder? How do I make Top Gun better? How do I make all the TV shows we're working on high town and all these amazing race and all these other shows that we're, we're, we're doing better. And that's what keeps me going. <laughs> Love it. Best advice you have ever received. Uh, my aunt said to me once I was offered a job and it wasn't something I was terribly interested in, but the money was really good. And she said to me, follow your passion, get involved in something you really love. And I love movies. So that's what I pointed my career towards. It was never about the money. It was always about doing the work and enjoying the work. Oh, I love that. Greatest sports movie of all time. I can't answer that because I made one call. <laughs> I'm going to remember the Titans. I love Remember the Titans. Actually, that was a tee up for Remember the Titans because I think I've watched Remember the Titans on every bus ride with every team that I've ever played on. Every plane rides, it's always been on. It's a fantastic movie. And, you know, Jerry, I really like your work because you've made movies that have solid messages in them that, you know, my kids, my kids' kids, my brothers, sisters, my nephews, nieces, that they can all watch. And I love that. I love your work that you do. Um, I miss going to the movies, Jerry. So I can't wait for Top Gun Maverick to come out. Um, you know, I can't wait. But Jerry, listen, I really, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, it, this has been um, very, very exciting for me. I've taken the whole week to try to prepare the best way I can for you. I really appreciate it. And to all the fans that are watching, I know they appreciate it. They're going to be looking out for the Seattle Kraken. Um, and, uh, congratulations once again on becoming an owner in the national hockey league. It really is the best league in the world. So congratulations to you and your partners. By the greatest a athletes in the world too. hundred percent. And you're one of them. So it's, it's an honor to be on your show, PK. Thanks for, you know, giving me time to talk about my, what my passions. Hey, thank you, Jerry. I really appreciate it. And I'll hopefully we can get back on the ice soon and slap the old biscuit around. I'd love to be out there with you. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Jerry Bruckheimer, the best movie producer to ever walk the planet, in my opinion. And one of the 32nd NHL franchise owners of the Batman 8 expansion teams. We had him on the Ugly Duck podcast. That's another notch, another feather in our hat. Thank you very much, Jerry, for coming on. And that's a wrap. Thank you, PK. Thanks for my guest of honor today, Jerry Bruckheimer, for joining the show. Also, a special thanks to friend of the show, Steve Dangle. Be sure to check back next week for another episode of the Ugly Duck Podcast. Follow, like, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to like and subscribe on my YouTube channel as well. Check out my picks for this round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. I want to hear all about it. Make sure you leave your comments below. This is Subinator, and the Subinator is out. Yeah.